College Station because it's summertime and we're coming up to where school's about to start and lives are about to change again and lots of transition taking place. Um, so it's an exciting time. It's a neat time. And then on top of that, it's just an exciting time to be alive. I don't know if you keep up with the news at all, but there's some crazy things happening. Uh, at least it's exciting. Uh, today I'm going to be following up on a lesson I taught a couple of weeks ago on holiness. I ran out of time, unfortunately, because it's such a broad topic, such a big topic. And um, I was getting into um, some details, and then I, I, I was just short of getting into uh, legalism and what we would call Christian liberty. So I'm going to try to get into that a little bit today, and uh, we'll go from there, and I hope I have enough time. So I've got to keep my eye on the clock. I'm not good at that. Uh, thankfully, the pastor's here to help me. Uh, Stay centered on it. If anybody is getting text messages about our live stream not working, just let them know it's not working. Uh, <laughs> we uh, got a little hardware issue, I think, and it's, it's just not working. So we're going to record it and upload later. Uh, but we do have a, a wonderful online group. So if it is uh, up by the time these people are watching online, welcome. If not, you're not welcome, apparently. First John chapter 2. Verse 3. I'm going to start with that and I'm going to do a little bit of review from a few weeks ago and then we'll go a little bit further. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Um, I hope you have your Bibles today. There's going to be a lot in your Bible. Less of it is probably going to be on the screen. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We had a uh, retreat this past week and we we're talking about words. How in uh, biblical time we, we, we use these words so flippantly now, but no knowledge, understand what is knowledge. Knowledge is, is in first action and interaction. Same thing with belief. Today you can have knowledge that does not interact and you can have belief that does not have action. Uh, neither one is really true, but that's what we believe to be the truth. So hereby we know that we know him. Does anybody know that you know? I, I hope so. And I, I pray that we can get into the Word of God and know that we know if we keep His commandments. There's a, there's a responsibility on our part to say, I'm going to keep His commandments. And this is out of 1 John. This is not out of the Old Testament where we say, oh, all commandments are done away with. It's just grace and there's no, nothing else. No responsibility on our side. Well, the reality is God still has commandments. God still has a, a type of law. And we're going to go over that today. If we keep his commandments, verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we, the, we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. So there should be an interaction and action. If we we're going to know God or claim to know Him at all, there should be an interaction with Him, with His Word, uh, with our body. Our, we're holistic. We're not separating ourselves. And so we get that out of 1 John. The importance of holiness, and I'm going to do a quick review. Uh, we find in Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to skip down and read a little less than I did last time in verse 14. It says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Do you understand the severity of holiness? It's necessary. This is what we must have. If you're going to see the Lord, you must be holy. Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by it many become defiled. I'm going to get down to a couple of reasons. And I'm getting a lot of my notes here from Dr. David Bernard. He was one of my professors at graduate school. And uh, amazing the way he thinks. Anybody like systematic thinking? You're not flippantly, you're not just spurting out whatever comes out and then all of a sudden it's backwards. I'm, I do that sometimes and I get in trouble. And so it's better to, to have a system of laying down a broad uh, basis for speaking and then narrow down from there. And that's kind of what he does. And so I took a lot of his thought process and modeled it after that. And so there's a couple of reasons for holiness. We're not going to get into the details just yet, but we're working broad and you get a little narrow. Uh, first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. We do this for the Lord. We do this for God. 
It says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Your body is the temple. Often we can confuse that with the church and say, this is the temple. This is the place where the, the Holy Ghost moves. This is the only place where it's restrained. If you want healing, you come here. If you want peace in your life, you, you come here. But the reality is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, can move in you. Not just can, but it should move in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. That sounds so simple, but reality is we, also, we often confuse Who's the leader here? Who, who, who do we serve? Do we serve ourselves or do we serve God? I pray that we, we can understand that we, we serve God. Therefore, the, the reason for holiness is for him first, not for ourselves, not to put it in front of anybody and say, well, I, by my works, I am holy. By my own effort, I am holy. By my uh, prestige, I am holy. By my position, I am holy. That's not what holiness is for. It is primarily for the Lord. Right. For a relationship with him. Then the next one would be for, for others. Matthew chapter 5 or 16. I'll read it for you. It says, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. So we, we must let our light shine before men. Uh, hide it under a bushel. No. no. <laughs> but also for self in Hebrews 12, 14 it says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. So if you, you do want to be saved and you want to make it to the throne room of heaven, you want to worship God, it's a little selfish, but we should probably be a little holy. If we're going to be in a holy presence, we should make ourselves holy. Uh, the basis for holiness is faith, love, the Spirit of God, and, our, and it's our responsibility. I'm going to skip through that because I did it all a few weeks ago. And if you want to go back and you missed it, you can go on YouTube and it is there. And there is audio, so don't worry about that. Uh, there's several teachers of holiness, and I'm just doing a quick review. Several teachers of holiness would, first of all, be the Word of God, the Bible. Often, if we're not careful, we bypass the Word. Yep. And we say, Pastor, you tell me what to do. You don't even need to quote a scripture. I'm going to trust you on every little thing. Just tell me what to do. Give me the rule. Give me the, give me the listing. And that's all I need. I don't need scripture. Well, we have a responsibility as Christians to take the Word of God and take it serious. Read it, to understand it, to put it into our heart and our mind and, and, and even linger on it. And the and Word even talks about meditating on His Word. So the first teacher of holiness would be Scripture. The second would be a godly leader. You could say pastor, a teacher, someone that is literally teaching the Word of God. That's a teacher. But you don't just skip over the Word of God. And then also I would say the, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Working, It will not contradict the Word of God. And this is on many levels. Um, not just in holiness, but in revelation. Oftentimes we, we hear people have a new revelation of, of some new doctrine. Something has come out. And they want to propagate it. And they say, I had a dream. I had a vision. I had a thought. God spoke to me. But we're all looking at the Word and we're saying, where is that at? <laughs> where is that at? I don't see that in the Word. So your, your dream can never contradict Scripture. And if it does, then you're the one that's wrong. Right. It was what you ate. It was some, I don't know. I, I, I can't explain that, but you're the one that's wrong. Um, let's see here. John 16 and 8 says, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The ASB version says that he, when it's come, will convict the world in respect of sin. This is conviction. This is the, the Spirit of God working in your life. I hope we've felt conviction at some point in your, in your journey. Right. As you're learning, as you're developing as a Christian, you should not just have pastor give me the list, but also I want to be convicted on certain things that are very specific to me and you. And This is the, the dual side of Christian liberty. Oftentimes we think Christian liberty is just the freedom of doing whatever you want, but it's also the conviction of being able to change your life according to the Spirit of God when you feel it. Right. Yep. Right. Which is a higher calling. Which is, is even more tough at times. So we don't ignore Christian liberty because we say, oh, that's just a, you do what you want. But it's also, when I feel convicted, I should act on that. And I should not ignore it. The definition of holiness, like I said, this is just a review. Uh, God's absolute perfection and purity on, 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 for God. 
Than not us. We, we cannot. Is anybody perfect in this room? <laughs> is anybody completely pure? No, but, but, for, but the Lord is. But for us, it's conformity to the character and the will of God. We can conform to the will of God. We can follow the will of God. We can say, God, I'm yours. I can, you do with me what you want. I am a servant. I'm part of your kingdom. I want to be what you want me to be. And there should be a mindset shift when you come into the kingdom of God that, Lord, I want to be holy. I want to be exactly what you want me to be. And that's what we can do. Being Christ-like, Romans 13, 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians 4, 19, 19 says, my little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. So there should be a shift in your thinking, a shift in your mindset from what the things you have done, the, the, the world, we can call it that, we can call it worldliness, Right. The, the man of sin, the, the one that, that lived in a way that was selfish, to the one that now you're no longer selfish. You're more in line with the kingdom of God and saying, God, I'm completely yours. Separation in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership hath righteousness with lawlessness? Lawless, lawlessness excuse me. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, with wickedness? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with the idols? And this is the key part. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. This relationship is so tight. I'm going to be their God. Singular. He didn't say I'm going to be one of their gods. He didn't say, I'm going to be an idol that maybe that, that'll, they'll worship on one day of the week. I'm going to have just a portion of their time. But he said, I will be their God and they will be my people. There's a complete commitment on both sides. The relationship is reciprocal and you are together. It's an amazing thing. Anybody ever seen unity in a team and you're just amazed at this is the working of a team? Pastor used an illustration in the huddle today about the basketball team and how everyone played a certain role. And yet, as an onlooker, you don't know exactly what role that is until it starts taking place. But the same thing in, 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 in our walk with God as, as we partner with the kingdom of God and, and where you say, Jesus, I, I want to be on your team, but I want you to place me right where you want me to be. I don't want to be out of your will. I want to be in your will. I, we were working with the young adults at this retreat this past week, and oftentimes at that age, I don't know if you've been there, but at, at some point in your life, you ask God, what is your perfect will for me? Anybody ever ask that? What is your perfect will? I want to be exactly dead in the center of your will. Often we pray that, and, and we want this revelation that's going to be revealed over 20 years, 30 years. God, tell me what I'm going to be in 50 years. That's, that's illogical, and to be honest, it, it's, it's not practical, and it would probably scare many of us. It, it, and some of you guys, you, you lived those years. So what would you have done differently? You probably would have changed a few things. But his word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, and he shows us not 20, 30 years down the road. He shows us the next step, and his word it does that. It's amazing. Yeah. But the teamwork, the unity of, of working together and the kingdom of God is amazing. Verse 17, therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Let's see here. I'm kind of skipping through because I want to get to the, the good part. Dedication. So we have separation, but also de dedication in Romans 12 and 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. We serve a merciful God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice that's wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is that dedication that, God, I am yours. I'm yours. I know that there will be other things pulling at my life. I know that there will be moments in my life that uh, maybe I, I have this desire for the, the, the biggest house, the newest car, the whatever it is. And all of a sudden, my attention can shift from the Lord to a new idol. Not saying houses are your house is an idol, but almost anything can become one. That's right. Verse two: and Be not conformed to this world. So, 
pastor said the other day, we're going to have to get comfortable with not being liked. Not being approved of on everything you do. There's, there's some things that we say, you know what, I do not care what you think. I'm going to give myself to the Lord. And whatever that means, that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is the perfect will of God. And, and often we're looking for the details that's in our life, but we don't want to look to the word of God. We have the known will of God that's in his word. The absolute known. That is that you would have a relationship with him. That you would be separate unto him. You would be dedicated unto him. You're called to glory and virtue, Second Peter chapter 1 says. There's this known will of God that you cannot bypass to get to the unknown. Right. That's right. We, as youth, immature minds would say, I want to know the unknown before I know the known. That's, that's the problem. That's if you cannot do the base things, a lot of people want to go and do something great for the Lord, but they cannot pray. They want to do something great for the Lord, but they, they can't fast for just a little while. They, they can't read the word. They, they, there's the, the basic things, the, the known will of God that we might have a relationship with him before I risk it all and just go off into the wind seeking the unknown. Which is exciting, but also very dangerous. <laughs> so that is dedication. There's a couple areas of holiness. The fruit of the Spirit would be the first one. Our primary, maybe not primary, but one of the, the largest that stands out to us is, do you possess the fruit of the Spirit? We see this in Galatians chapter 5. If you ever want to study that, Galatians chapter 5. It says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, patience. All these things. Gentleness, uh, faith, meekness, uh, but then our attitudes. And I think that would blend in quite well with uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Our attitudes show our holiness or lack thereof. Our thoughts, Matthew chapter 15, I'll, I'll give a little bit of scripture for this. Verse 18 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. So if we cannot control our tongue, Usually it means you probably couldn't have controlled your thoughts either. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. This is a completely different world. People who come into the church, they, they, we have to understand that what we're doing is a complete shift. It's not a, a blending of the two. It's not of saying, I'm going to pacify my flesh while also pacifying God. You're not satisfying either, and one will eventually win. Yep. That, that, that is the reality of living for God. Right. You can only do that for so long, and the reality is you're not satisfying either. Stewardship of the body is, includes holiness. We also have the tongue in James chapter 1, and the eye in Psalm 101, and verse 2 and 3. There, holiness is so broad. This is why we got so in-depth with it last time. Uh, then you get into adornment, the dress, and the hair, and you see 1 Timothy 2 and 8. And I'll read through that a little bit because there's a couple of verses here. Uh, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Com remember, this is a complete shift from who you were. Right. Anybody remember who you were before the Lord oh, yes. saved you? Thank you God. Before you were filled with the Spirit of God. And this was completely shifted. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shame, facedness, and sobriety. With, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which become women professing godliness with good works. This is not Old Testament commandments. We're seeing this in 1 Timothy, actually. People say, oh, relegate any kind of, any kind of holiness to the Old Testament. That's not the truth. It's not the truth. So modesty, avoiding adornment, uh, moderation and cost, distinction between male and female, 1 first, first Deuteronomy, excuse me, excuse me, Deuteronomy, Chapter 22, verse 5. The women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. First Deuteronomy. It's the only Deuteronomy. <laughs> Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination of the Lord. And when you see abomination in Scripture, God hates it. He hates it. And did He not stop hating something? No. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He still has His desire to see His church separate. 
unto him. Uh, activities that are, that are not godly, there, there are many of those. Uh, there's the sanctity of marriage. We see that in 1 Corinthians 6. These are holiness things, which we often don't define them as holiness. But the sanctity of marriage, honesty and integrity, that's a holiness issue. If you, cannot, you, if you can look holy on the outside but be very dishonest in your business, you're not holy. Your fellowship, who, who you hang out with, all these things come into holiness. And I encourage you to, to go deeper on that in your own studies. Uh, worldly values, 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And so right now we're defining. I love You love it when God gives us definition. It's not so ambiguous. It's not vague. But he's saying, you know what? Here's the world. Let's talk about the world for a second. And he gets into this. And he gives us some idea and some structure to what he's talking about. And I, I love that. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. But it is of the world. So he's, he's making a definition. There's a, a line in the sand saying, the world is where you used to be, but the church is where you're at now. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every challenge, every problem in humanity has come from one of the three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You can think of any moment in your life where you failed utterly, and you can attribute that moment to one of the three and say, wow. That was a lot of pride I had to just ruin that portion of my life. I don't like saying ruining my life because God is a redeeming God. Yeah. Often we say, oh, so and so ruined their life. Thankfully, God has a lot of grace. Verse 17. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There's a transition from living... We've all been alive. God gave us breath to breathe. We've been allowed to have the ability to breathe air, to walk the earth, to do things, and even to have a choice. Whether I want to be in the church or whether I want to be in the world, he's given us the ability to do these things. But ultimately, we go from just surviving and living. But scripture says that he's given us life more abundantly once we're in the church. But not only that, but life everlasting. So we, we have this transition from living. Anybody ever been there where it's just, well, I'm alive today. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I just <laughs> living day to day, paycheck to paycheck. I'm just trying to make it. But what God is promising his church is you can have abundant life here on earth. It's going to pass away. But after that, if you stay in the church, you're going to have life everlasting. From life, from living to abundant life. To everlasting life. And that's the exciting thing about what God is offering his church. Now we're going to get into the parts that I did not get to last time. Uh, the next part topic I guess we could talk about would be legalism versus love. Legalism versus love. There's, they can both accomplish similar things. They, they look a lot alike. Uh, one's sustainable. One is not. One has power. One has the facade of power. Legalism versus love. Matthew chapter 3, 23, if you'll turn there. We're going to read it from verse 1 to verse 8. <clears throat> There's a couple of things I want to point out. And, and really, this will go into verses 23, 24. So you're going to be staying in, in Matthew chapter 23 for quite a while. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. And this is a, a very hard part because Jesus uh, makes a lot of enemies here. He, he, we think that Jesus was such a loving God that he would never condemn anybody. He would never uh, shake anything up. He, he was just there to offer so peaceably. But, but reality is he, he shook systems. He destroyed systems. We love systems. Systems are good. They give us structure. They give us the ability to accomplish great things. But if you're not careful, there's a thing called drift. And we're going to see that here in Matthew chapter 23, where God's people historically drifted. 
that propensity that we see in the Old Testament of drifting, which would, could create the Pharisees and have this system that is, was not, it became something that it was never meant to be. We can also see today, and you'll probably see some parallels. But in verse 1, it says, And Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, so that's his audience. So he's talking about the Pharisees. Verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. That's pretty good. That's a compliment in their mind, I'm sure. But not the works that they do. He said that they, they tell you everything that's good, but they don't do them themselves. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. This is a, a, a group of people, Jewish people, that would be called Pharisees. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, maybe, but I'll try, phylacteries broad and their fingers long. They, they used to have these little bags or boxes that they would carry with them, and it would have uh, written segments of the Torah in it, and it would have the law with them. And they would have it, and they would make it really big at times, and they want to make sure that everyone sees it. And they say, hey, look at me, I, I'm a Pharisee. I'm, I'm really serving God better than anybody else. And you're, I'm going to make sure it's known. I'm going to put it in your face. That you're, you're going to know it. And when I come in the room, you're going to know it. Uh, because I'm special. So they, they make it long, and they make it large. And they love the place of honor at feasts. And the best seats in the synagogue. They walk in, and, hey, put me up a little higher than everybody else. I, I, I'm not just like them. I'm better than them. And no doubt, when they spoke around everybody, they said, oh, we're the best, we're the best, hoorah, hoorah. It was a big, you know, they're, they're there to let everybody know there is a hierarchy and we're at the top. And greetings in the marketplaces of being called rabbi. Say, teacher, master, master, teacher. You're the one that knows it all. You're the know-it-all. They want to be called the know-it-all constantly by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. This is Jesus speaking. For you have one teacher or master, and you are all brothers. He tells us that, you know what? You, can all, you all have something to learn. As long as we're here on this earth, we all have equal value. There is not one that, that comes out the top and he's the, 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 the answer man that's always going to be infallible. And what he says is the absolute truth. And, 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 and I'm not, even pastor would say this. He can, we all have our ability to be wrong. It takes a little bit of humility to say that. It takes a little bit of humility to say, I, I may not have it all, but I do know that the word of God is right. This is what I do know. And so we do have respect. And we understand that there is wisdom in, in men. But we do always check it in the word of God. We don't bypass it in favor Amen. of humanity. We don't bypass it in favor of a human idol. Amen. So seven times through Matthew chapter 23, following verse 8, we see this phrase, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's a pretty harsh Harsh word right there. Hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. He accused them of shutting up the kingdom of heaven. And you can spend some more time reading this. But shutting up the, uh, the widow's houses and while making long prayers and making up for their wrong. As long as they pray louder, pray broader with more excellence and uh, have their great oratory skills, and, and what they're wrong is can be diminished because they are really good prayers. <laughs> Ask me to pray at the next family meeting. I'm going to pray. You know? I'm going to, oh, but, but ignore what's going on back here. They go out of their way to proselyte, proselyze, uh, convert a heathen, only to make them worse than before. They twisted logic so uh, to justify lying. It is, is basically that script, scripture between verse 16 and verse 22 or so. They had this thing where they could swear by certain things within the temple. 
And it was kind of like this inside knowledge of if you swear by uh, the gold of the altar and not by the altar, then you're committed to that, whatever you swore by. But if it was by the altar itself, then you could, that's actually kind of like putting your finger behind your back and you turn your... Oh, I had my fingers crossed. <laughs> you didn't know that? that it, was, it was a huge joke, really. It was becoming such a facade of righteousness. And, and this is why when Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, because he was tired and sick of Pharisees that were twisting logic and making their own thing up as they would go. And year after year, drifting would take place. That's why Jesus' timing was so important, because it was just getting... It was delusional. It was crazy. And you could go deeper into that, but there was, their logic was just so far off. And he called them you blind guides in verse 24. And also in verse 16. You blind guides. Anybody want to go maybe a tour of the Grand Canyon? And you hire a guide. <laughs> and, and they're blind, by the way. He's blind, by the way. Yeah, that, that's probably an issue. That, that, that probably would not turn out well. And, and he's, oh, if you just walk, follow me. Follow me right over here. This is the most beautiful view. Trust me, I've been told it was amazing. <laughs> like, that's the reality that they're living in. And they're told, yeah, just do what I, what, what I tell you to do. Just do what I tell you to do. But Jesus says, don't do what they do. Don't go where they go. There's, there's some problems here. They're, they're telling you a lot of good stuff. But what they're doing is so wrong. And so he calls them in verse 24, you blind guides which strain a gnat and swallow a camel. He also, in verse 27, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like unto white sepulchres, these tombs, beautiful, decorated, made just, just beautiful, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Jesus shook their system. Jesus completely, it, it, it made them mad, to be honest. And, and he wasn't even talking to them. He was talking to the crowd about them. That made them even more mad because he wasn't talking to their face at the time. And so they're upset. And you, could, uh, you don't really have to imagine, you know what they did to him. But he also, in verse 33, he calls them serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? You, you've perverted scripture. What should be the basis of our living, the basis of, of everything we do, you've twisted it and you made it something that gratified yourself. And so the definition of legalism is basing salvation on works and imposing non-biblical rules. We see legalism. It's condemned in Romans chapter 3 and also in chapter 7. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse, chapter 7 verse 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. He's, he's contrasting old and new. But also our spirit should change in that process. This is the spirit of love. That, 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 that is even stronger. and it, it actually demands more of us than the law itself. There's a couple of dangers to legalism. It creates self-righteousness. We see that in the life of the Pharisees. Self-righteousness, I can do no wrong. I, I'm the one you go to for every, everything. You know, you need to buy a new car, come to me. I will tell you which one to get. I'll tell you everything. I, I've, I've never done anything wrong, actually. Every car I bought was, was the best. Lack of inward holiness. There's an outward presentation that can be seen, but the inward full of dead men's bones. Lack of understanding of principles. Principles transcend time and location. It's just the truth. Principles. The Word of God transcends time and location too, by the way. Yep. But if we're not careful, we'll create things that can never transcend time or location. Living by minimum requirements and loopholes. You know, the, if you swear by the gold of the altar but not the altar, you're, you're hey, make a promise that you don't ever have to keep. Loopholes. Loopholes. 
hypocrisy and inconsistency, man-made rules, hard and fast rules that signal superiority towards the ones who make them, misapplication of principles, like the Pharisees, we can lose the purpose over time. It's a drifting. What God created as holy and what he created as, as a strong biblical principle, they completely twisted it. So when Jesus is walking through the field and there's corn and they're talking about, oh, you, you worked on the Sabbath and you violated this. Or maybe there was a nail in someone's shoe. It, it, it gets to where it's just, okay, you're the spirit of the law. What God has, has put into that, you've lost it. Yeah. You've lost it. Difficulty in maintaining the system, and at some point, it fails and becomes harder over time. Uh, judgmental, con uh, uh excuse me, con con I'm trying to think of the word, combination type attitude. But the al alternate to this, because we can fall into that and we can do this in our homes, and, and I, I believe that Scripture tells us about the priesthood of every believer. We do not have a priest. We do not have a veil. We, it was torn when Jesus died and buried and rose again. All of a sudden, you have you no know, high priest. This, this spirit of the Lord working within you should cause you to be reading his word, to be making choices on conviction and, 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 and the word of God. And you say, well, I'm not going to ignore what God wrote. And so the proper alternative is love for the Lord. Right. Love for the Lord. If I love him, I'm going to keep his commandments, Scripture That's says. Right. We, we spoke on that earlier. If I love him, I'm not going to live a crazy, just lustful life. I'm not going to walk the way I used to walk. I'm not going to talk the way I used to talk. There's got to be a shift, and it comes through the power of the love of truth. Right. Yeah. The love of the Lord. Love. God has a moral law. God has a moral law. Everyone wants to say, and I say not everyone, but a lot of people want to say, that the law done away. God's moral law still stands. We cannot say, oh, well, the Old Testament's done away. It's no longer applicable in any way. We have no, we shouldn't even be quoting the Old Testament. There's people that believe that. <coughs> oh, it's there. It's just a history. That's all it is. It's in the past and it's never coming back out. But what we see in the Old Testament, we see God's, the things he loves, the things he hates. We see what he appreciates. We see his pattern of doing. He has not changed. Right. He, we see his intention in relationship. We, we see so much. We're informed. And Daniel hit on it the other day. The schoolmaster. The one that brought us to Jesus. That brought us to that point of recognizing sin. Would be right. the Old Testament. Right. Why would you ignore that? Galatians 3.24 Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So we have this shift from rules and law to faith that works. There's a shift. There's a transition. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved. Are you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. I can think of who I used to be, and I can say, God, you're gracious. Yes. God, you're amazing. You, you, you had so much patience when I didn't deserve it. You had so much mercy when I didn't deserve it. It's the, the unmerited favor of God that's on all my life and on upon every single person in this room. God's grace is amazing. And so you're saved by grace through faith and then out of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we, is, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So it says not of works, but we're created unto good works. Yeah, yeah. The point is that we should be working for the kingdom. We should be doing things. If, if our knowledge, if we want to know that we know that we know, then we should be interacting and acting on what we know. There's no room for knowledge, gnosis, but not doing. There's no room for having all the degrees in the world of theology, but being an atheist. There are many. Yeah, there, are. there are many that say, I know the word, but I don't believe it. I don't do it. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I'm going to hurry to Christian liberty. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. 
Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. There's the words liberty and love. We have been called unto liberty. Freedom from sin in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we just say that because His grace is so great that it's not an ending, right? Our might as well exploit it. He says, God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Death, meaning ending, like my, my old self, my old life is done. And so it, and he has saved us. We have freedom from the law. In Romans 7 verse 5 says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Verse 6, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. So that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written codes. It's penalty, it's uh, powerlessness, it's, it's misuse, it's ceremonial aspects. Freedom in non-moral matters, Romans 14 and 4. Who art thou that judges another man's servant to his own master? We're going to stay in 14 for a little while, by the way, if you want to turn there. To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So meat versus no meat. Uh, regarding certain days, we see this early on in the chapter. And we're saying, who's going to judge another man? In verse 9, when we read start there, Romans 14, 9 says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and were revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. By why? But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give account of, the next word is himself, to God. The pastor is not going to be standing beside me when I go to the judgment seat of the Lord. I can't say, Pastor, you told me what to do, and I, I hardly ever read the word. But that's going to justify me. Pastor, Pastor can't do that. He's not going to have that power. He can, he can have some influence in a court here in Brazos County. He can go up and stand on your behalf and, and witness for you and say, Hey, I, I know the character. He, he would never have done this. He or she would have. But when it comes to the judgment seat of God, yeah. we're going to be judged by the word of God. God's moral law always applies. We see this continuing. Homosexual acts in Leviticus 6, 18, 22 did not change. God did not just change it from one day to the next or from one testament to the next, what he loved and what he hates. The looting genders in Deuteronomy 22 and 5 or pride of Sodom in Ezekiel 16, 49. We see that there are some standards in God's moral law that continue. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth this transgresseth, King James, also law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So ultimately, and I've got one minute, we can ask a couple questions when it comes to holiness. And I, I said this last time, but is it beneficial to me? You fill in what it is. Is it beneficial? Am I growing in the Lord or am I falling back? Sometimes we can call this backsliding. Is it beneficial? The next one, can it gain power over me? Is there a potential that this thing, whatever it is, will control me? It may not right away. It may take some time. But can it gain power over me? Can The next one, can I give God glory in it? Does God gain any glory in me doing this? And the last one, can it harm others? Can it harm others? And we've got a lot of scripture for all of these. But it's amazing what holiness can do. It is the banner of his people. It's the, it's the signifier of separation. What, what, what holiness can do for the kingdom, it, it's amazing. It's a force that can't be reckoned. It's, it's an army that walks into a diverse crowd of people that they're lost and miserable. But when they see holiness, yep. 
they see hope. When holiness walks into a kingdom, system shatter. It's amazing when you think about what God can do in his power. Why don't we stand across the room? I, I want us to pray. Obviously, I think this is something that we should all go deeper into. I, I do believe we go into some in our next program. So uh, we'll be speaking in huddle coming up next week and week after that. Uh, Jared Howell is in charge of our Connect team. So if you've not gone to Connect and gotten connected to the church, <laughs> uh, that's actually a three-week process of, you know, at 10 o'clock a.m., you're going to miss this lesson, but you're going to go in there. You're going to learn about the church. You're going to learn about yourself, all that. After that, you have the opportunity to go into what we call next. It's 12 weeks, long Bible study, and you're learning about the Word of God. It's amazing. You're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it with a group of people. You're usually eight to ten people. You're asking questions. You're talking. And if it needs to go longer than 12 weeks, we could probably even do that. Pretty cool. And so I encourage us all, if you saw, heard any scripture or you've seen anything, wrote it down, read and learn. We're going to be judged by his word. The severity is, is great. We cannot diminish what God has given us. This is not changed to a pulpit. It's not held back behind bars. But his word is available. If you don't have a Bible, come get with us. I want to give you a Bible. But God has given us no excuse today. There is no excuse not to live for the Lord. Why don't we pray? Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. It's strong, it's powerful, it's changing, it disrupts systems, it disrupts worldliness, it shakes the ground of in anything that has been built in opposition to you. Lord, we ask that you help us today. We ask that you convict our hearts and help us to grow stronger in your word daily. Give us the strength, give us the desire to learn and to honor you. We love you, Lord. We thank